Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for being here on this lovely sunny afternoon. Um, it is such a pleasure to see so many of you here for this evening's event. Um, so, by way of introduction, my name is Maeve Ryan. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies, and I co-direct the Centre for Grand Strategy. Um, and one of the kind of veins that runs through a lot of our, our centre's uh, projects is this theme of applied history, the idea of kind of interrogating the role that history has played and can play in informing statecraft, uh, informing foreign policy, to look at the track record of how history gets used, how history gets understood and thought about by policymakers and by those who shape, um, well, in particular, foreign policy, but, but, but just more broadly, that kind of general theme of statecraft. And we think about the ways, deliberate and otherwise, that history gets used um, negatively or the ways that history gets used maybe um, in, in ways that lead to adverse outcomes. Um, and so it's a privilege as part of this role to get to invite and host some of the leading thinkers, the leading historians who are engaging with exactly these questions and looking at the ways that, you know, battles over history, you know, uh, contests over narratives, dominant narratives, um, and the ways that history can be a battleground itself um, have shaped policy in, in, the, in the past and, and in the present. And of course, we're at a particularly interesting inflection point, I would say, it's fair to say, in, the, in British history a time when, uh, when the ideas of history and then understandings of especially imperial history, histories of slavery and race and so on, are part of a particularly live debate, a kind of history is infusing a very, um, a very live conversation that is in, in many ways characterizing public life in this country for the last few years and certainly shaping policy. Um, and sort of trying to untangle all of that and trying to untangle the last 20 years, especially sort of since, let's say, since, since Afghanistan or, you know, the, the years since the, um, the 2008 financial crash and all of the, you know, incredibly uh, complex and um, turbulent events and, and trends that have shaped those years. And the ways that, you know, some of these things um, and, and some of those tensions and some of the debates that have emerged in that context have shaped a very polarized present. It's an extremely complicated and, and difficult thing to do, and it sort of gives me a headache to try to untangle it all. But luckily, I don't have to because um, our very distinguished speaker has written this book, which I, I very, very highly recommend. Uh, it's an incredibly, I mean, um, incredibly, I think, clear and uh, you know, clear, concise, very beautifully written um, untangling of this complexity um, and, uh, and making sense of the sort of the, the culture war phenomenon that we're living through in the present. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening, Alan. Uh, Professor Alan Lester is Professor of Historical Geography at the University of Sussex. Um, probably needs no introduction to anyone in this room. I imagine you're all here because of his extraordinary reputation, his, his, his authorship of books including Imperial Networks, Colonial Lives Across the British Empire, uh, Colonization and the Origins of Humanitarian Governance, a book that particularly influenced my own research, uh, Ruling the World, and then, of course, Deny and Disavow, as, as well as, you know, many, many other articles and contributions. Also, his, his reputation and role as, a, as a, an increasingly important public historian and the role that Alan has played um, in, I think, demonstrating the... Um, I, I, I kind of think of, of Alan as a sort of masterclass in how to engage in that kind of debate, and it's, how to engage, I think, constructively, meticulously, and constructively on Twitter, um, engaging in debates sometimes with, uh, with people who don't seem to be interested in having as productive a debate as he wants to. And, and I kind of a masterclass in doing that in a, in a really, I think, constructive, respectful, and, um, and dignified tone. Um, so I've certainly learned a lot from, uh, from Alan as, uh, about the ways that historians can engage with these questions and the ways that we can make a positive contribution. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome um, uh, Alan Lester. We're going to have a, a talk for about 40 to 45 minutes or so. We're going to have time for questions then. And I hope you'll all join us afterwards for um, a reception. It's in the War Studies meeting room, the Dockerill meeting room, actually, as it's now called. Um, and so do please join us afterwards for that. Anyway, without further ado, Professor Alan Lester. Well, thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> Can it, thank you. Can I just check? Can you all hear me okay? Is the microphone working? Good. My voice isn't particularly strong today, so I'll, I'll uh, hopefully be able to project through the microphone okay. I'm not sure if I can live up to that billing, but thank you very much, Mary, for your generous comments. Um, so what I'll, I'll try and do in the next sort of 40, 45 minutes is say a bit about why I think the um, imperial past, the colonial past, has been politicised to the extent that it has in recent years in Britain. Um, and then towards the end, I'll engage with a, a particularly prominent figure in the imperial culture wars, Nigel Bigger, um, whom I gather some of you encountered recently, um, and talk about some of the um, disagreements that I, I have with him. 
So the political context first. So over the last few years, we've seen people in the Conservative government under Boris Johnson, then very briefly Liz Truss, and now Rishi Sunak, energise an unprecedented and, to me, quite disturbing culture war. Culture war is a phenomenon first defined by James Davison Hunter in the USA, in which, as he puts it, politics becomes a proxy for cultural positions that simply won't book any kind of dissent or argument. It's a form of tribalism that began in the 1960s with conservative institutions resisting the advances in civil rights for women and African Americans and the decline of religious authority. In the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, it reached new levels of intensity with Donald Trump's populist backlash uh, to Barack Obama's presidency. Trump and on this side of the Atlantic, Boris Johnson, both proved adept at manipulating social conservative sense of existential threat, leading populist movements that appealed to marginalized voters. The increasing inequalities and polarization of politics over the last decade has provided fertile ground for both men and their parties. In the UK, a buoyant post-Brexit populist wing of the Conservative Party, with relentlessly vociferous supporters in the press and a handful of proponents in academia, are waging their own rhetorical war on those who propose anti-racist, environmental and gender-related reforms, using the word woke as a sneering catch-all descriptor for such people. Young people who are sensitive to these issues are dismissed as snowflakes and accused of adopting a council culture by daring to speak out. The expertise of those who research uncomfortable facts has been dismissed by the most prominent of politicians. In the immediate aftermath of the Black Lives Matter protests and on this side of the Atlantic, the toppling of the um, Edward Colston statue in, in Bristol in June 2020, Boris Johnson's housing secretary, Robert Jenrick, declared, quote, we will save Britain's statues from the woke militants who want to censor our past. Then the digital culture and media secretary, Oliver Dowden at the time, instructed Britain's leading museums, galleries and heritage organisations that, quote, they must defend our culture and history from the noisy minority of activists constantly trying to do Britain down. Dowden's successor as Culture Secretary, Nadine Doris, was even more hardline, the Daily Mail declaring that she was promoted specifically, quote, to fight the woke warriors at culture. The Johnson government found willing allies in the right-wing press. From 2020 until now, the Mail, Express, Telegraph, Spectator and GBTV in particular have poured out a relentless barrage of articles and editorials waging the so-called war on woke. The record of the British Empire looms large in this politicking. They rail against academics and heritage organisations seeking to provide greater public knowledge of Britain's imperial history. They portray the National Trust's efforts to supply information about the role of slave ownership in its property's histories, or Kew Gardens' attention to enslaved people's role in sugar production, for instance, as deliberate attempts to inculcate national shame. For historians to point out that colonisation involved the considerable application of violence or that Britons tended to see other races as inferior is, in this new political context, apparently anti-British. One of Rishi Sunak's many problems as the current Prime Minister is dealing with a relatively large group of former Johnson-supporting Conservative MPs who are still wedded to this kind of politics through culture war. Alongside their stop-the-boats anti-refugee rhetoric, they see it as a key means of retaining so-called red wall seats gained in the 2019 Get Brexit Done election. They formed the Common Sense group of MPs who published their manifesto called Common Sense, Conservative Thinking for a Post-Liberal Age in 2021. The group's chair is Sir John Hayes. He was the man to whom Suella Braverman leaked confidential files in breach of the ministerial code which caused her resignation for all of a few days. Hayes declared, quote, some of what we have heard from public bodies, this is about including information on slavery and colonialism, has been mischievous, some of it has been sinister, and some of it has just been daft. <clears throat> it needs to be stopped in its tracks, end quote. The proud memory of the British Empire is sacrosanct for this influential and well-resourced lobby 
Quotes, Britain is under attack, wrote Gareth Bacon, MP, in the Common Sense Agenda. Not in a physical sense, he continues, but in a philosophical, ideological and historical sense. Our heritage is under a direct assault. The very sense of what it is to be British has been called into question. Institutions have been undermined. The reputation of key figures in our country's history has been reduced, end quote. Now, the common sense MPs admit that the history of slavery and colonialism was not always one of which to be proud. But in their manifesto, they try to deflect it as far as possible to the USA, where Black Lives Matter began. So quoting from their manifesto, claims of perceived injustice stem somewhere down the line from real injustice, they admit. Slavery was and is inhumane, as were the Jim Crow laws and segregation. However, they continue, the ensuing civil rights movement was a tremendous achievement in righting those wrongs. Once those very real laws were abolished, there was a vacuum which needed to be filled with more things to fix. As a result, although racism certainly does still exist, the real racism expanded to encompass perceived racism too. End quote. So the intent here is clearly to establish Black Lives Matter as a misplaced transplant to the UK from the USA, where it belongs, and even there, it may once have had some justification, but is now anachronistic. Whilst pandering to the Brexiteering common sense group, Boris Johnson also sought to deflect the critique offered by Black Lives Matter activists by appointing the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, or CRED, otherwise known <coughs> as the Sewell Committee, which produced the Sewell Report. The report's main intent was to deny that Britain still harbours structural racism. And one of its supporting thrusts was to deflect from any critical teaching of British colonialism. <clears throat> now, government reports, unsurprisingly, are supposed to gather evidence before drawing their conclusions. However, Boris Johnson seems uncannily to have anticipated this commission's eventual findings, even before it was announced. I think this is a country, he said, that has made huge progress in tackling racism. We should look sometimes at the positive stuff. We've got more young black and minority ethnic kids going to university than ever before, more black kids doing the tougher subjects at school, doing better than ever before in school. We don't hear enough of this positive stuff. Well, we certainly did once the CRED committee had produced its report. As Jonathan Portis has written, quote, in 35 years of both producing and consuming government reports, I don't think I've ever seen one where the evidence and analysis has been so comprehensively discredited so quickly and completely. In an unusual intervention, the United Nations was moved to label the report as, quote, an attempt to normalise white supremacy. The main issue was that in setting out its methodology, the report made it clear that any apparent racial disparities would be explained either by supposedly independent factors other than race, such as geography, and geography was treated as an independent factor in its own right, completely separate from race, or they would be classified simply as unexplained. From the very start then, the possibility that racism might be at play, for instance, in producing a geography of segregation in the housing market or in education, for example, that possibility was excluded. Portis concluded that while commissioned reports are supposed to result in evidence-based policymaking, this one is better viewed as rhetoric-based evidence-making. I want to come on to talk a bit about some of the emotional investments behind this, this politicking, because it's not all just shallow, cynical, short-term politicking. So I've mentioned one of the forces driving a resurgence of public denialism of the colonial past is the current government's belief that reinforcing social conservatism helps to detach northern working class voters from Labour in the Red Wall seats. <clears throat> but as Gareth Bacon's comment from the Common Sense Manifesto indicates, there is clearly something much deeper underlying whatever success the strategy might be achieving. As Peter Mitchell writes, at bottom there is the sense of betrayal and the anxiety of replacement, generational, cultural, gendered and racial. This terror is at the core of a frighteningly intense emotional charge, a sense never quite articulated but always present that the stakes are personal and existential. The backlash against revealing often previously hidden stories of British colonialism has come overwhelmingly from those whose self-esteem seems to be closely tied to a group identity rooted in continually re-established exclusive ideas of Britishness. <clears throat> 
Research on the psychology of denial is instructive here. As Joe Kendall writes, quote, when presented with information about historical episodes in which their group has taken the role of perpetrator, individuals are likely to experience a sense of threat to their identity in the form of guilt or shame, and may intuitively seek ways in which to avoid this threat. In such scenarios, defensive reactions are often employed to negate the threat. These defensive reactions include denying the accuracy of the information provided, blaming the victims of acts of violence, claiming that colonial rule in our case was necessary or enacted with good intentions, focusing on the sacrifices made by those who identified as Britons in the empire, and above all, the one that you see time and time again, what about are we? pointing out the bad things that other groups have also done in the past or are doing now. According to Kendall, who's done experiments, psychological experiments, the reaction that, quote, we might be bad, but at least we're not as bad as them, is a common one. Experiments have shown that after people have been challenged with uncomfortable historical facts about the behaviour of the group that they identify with, introducing the idea that other groups were just as bad can immediately restore their sense of pride. However, as Kendall notes, quote, defensive reactions are not always instinctive and can easily be instrumentalized by political actors looking to gain from acrimonious culture wars. Groups like History Reclaimed, which I'll come on to shortly, serve this purpose of finding and disseminating worse examples of perpetration carried out by other groups. One of the side effects of the competitive innocence, as Kendall calls it, that they help to establish is a loss of empathy, though, with the victims of violent acts, based on the notion that perpetrators in one's own national group must somehow have been justified in acting the way they did. Now, for a scholar of British colonialism, witnessing the explosion of polarised and simplistic argumentation over the empire's legacies in the last few years feels like a glimpse, I imagine, of what virologists and vaccinologists must have experienced as public discussion of COVID-19 exploded. As with so much of our post-Brexit politics, complexity, honesty and integrity in public discussions of empire have become rare commodities. Relations between Britons and Indigenous peoples varied enormously across a quarter of the Earth's land surface at the early 20th century empire's greatest extent and over 300 years. The indulged princes and merchants of post-uprising India experienced empire very differently from the Aboriginal people of Southern Australia, for instance, who resisted annihilation in the early 19th century. But everywhere, colonial administration rested on an everyday distinction, what Pater Chatterjee calls the rule of difference between the different races. Black lives tended not to matter as much as white lives in the British Empire. Yet historians who draw attention to the racial thinking and discriminatory practice that fundamentally underpinned the empire are now condemned by populist right-wing culture warriors. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter challenge, a relatively few but very well publicised commentators have managed to twist the practising of history as censoring, trashing or even destroying our national past. Historians, along with anti-racist activists, have found themselves accused of being part of this imaginary woke conspiracy against all that Britain stands for. And most professional historians of British colonialism, of whom I know many, base their research on evidence while admitting its limitations. They strive for objectivity while recognising that it's evasive. And they're driven by curiosity rather than contemporary politics, by and large. They seek to mitigate the ways in which the latter inevitably shapes the former. They're far from being the Marxist stroke CRT, critical race theory inspired radicals portrayed by some journalists and politicians. Their implicit distaste for unprovoked invasion and racism stems from their humanity and basic morality. It's not directed solely and vindictively, as they're often accused of, against the British, and it's not the result of a far-left political disposition in most cases. For the most part, they refuse to be drawn into the culture wars, polarising binaries. In the meantime, however, a wider section of society is being exposed to politicised caricatures of the British Empire that do an active disservice to the public understanding of history. And uh, I wrote Deny and Disavow <coughs> uh, in response to that. Talking of politicised caricatures brings me then to the, the next part of my talk, Nigel Bigger's Culture War uh, and his book, Colonialism, A Moral Reckoning. <coughs> 
Conservative denialism has unfortunately found pockets of vocal support in academia. I'll concentrate for the rest of this talk on one of the prime exponents who's gained considerable traction. Nigel Bigger, CBE, the former Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at the University of Oxford. And I should just say, I have no personal animosity whatsoever against Professor Bigger. I've never met him. Um, there is a, about to be an exchange between us published in the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History online in which he presumes that I, I do and that I am as politically motivated as he is. Um, I disagree. Bigger's writings on empire have been aligned with the common sense conservative faction's politics. Despite having revealed that he voted remain in the Brexit referendum, before publishing colonialism, Bigger contributed four articles to Briefings for Britain, formerly Briefings for Brexit. This lobbying group describes itself as, quote, a small group of volunteers, originally academics, with a firm conviction that Brexit was about reasserting popular control over decision making in the United Kingdom. Bigger's own participation in a government-backed culture war is manifested more directly, though, in his founding role in the History Reclaimed group of conservative scholars and his links with the Allied Restore Trust group. So in August 2021, a group of scholars, including Robert Toombs, who was appointed by Boris Johnson to a new Heritage Advisory Board to try and stop statues being taken down, Niall Ferguson, Andrew Roberts and Nigel Bigger banded together to create the History Reclaimed Project, which is now a private company. According to the Daily Mail, the group was established to battle Black Lives Matter's, quote, woke war on our great leaders. It's now um, Bigger's new book, Colonialism, is really the culmination of the History Reclaimed Project. It contains many of the stock defences of empire and attacks on supposedly woke activists and academics that feature on the group's website. Restore Trust is a pri another private company whose mission is to reverse the National Trust's efforts to tell the full history of their properties. Its members were incensed, especially by the National Trust publication of a report authored by Corinne Fowler and others, which highlighted the role of slave trading, slave ownership and colonial exploitation in its property owner's source of wealth. <clears throat> Restore Trust has twice tried to get its candidates elected to the National Trust Council in order to reverse its moves towards greater inclusivity. Two of its candidates for the 2022 National Trust Council elections, Zaria Masani and Jeremy Black, are also members of History Reclaimed. Both groups are regularly backed by The Telegraph, The Express, The Mail and The Spectator. The Mail in particular prompted the abusive trolling of Corinne Fowler while complaining, ironically, about council culture. Although Restore Trust has been obtuse about its funding sources, there are indications that it's part of a network of conservative think tanks and lobbying groups associated with the premises at 55 Tufton Street in London. One of the six people in Restore Trust's Meet the Team webpage is Neil Record, a billionaire former currency risk manager and conservative donor who backed the Institute of Economic Affairs. That was the think tank which encouraged Liz Truss's disastrous mini-budget in 2022. Record also chairs the Global Warming Policy Forum, which is skeptical of human-induced climate change. Bigger featured in a piece in the Mail, aligning himself with Restore Trust and declaring that, quote, the National Trust has shot itself in the foot by publishing the report on slavery and colonialism. He continued, it has really got a lot of its members annoyed. I am one of them. He went on to ask, what motivates people like Professor Fowler to apparently see racism everywhere, even when it isn't there? So now I want to come on to the, the book. So in recent weeks, Bigger's new book on the British Empire, Colonialism and Moral Reckoning, has become a bestseller. Listed at number 10 in the Sunday Times non-fiction sales list and topping Amazon's lists in a number of subcategories. Just like a scholarly monograph, it has extensive end notes, rather, stretching over 130 pages and a bibliography of 30 pages. It appears to be a rigorously researched account of colonial practices, as well as an analysis of the ethics of those practices. It's received glowing reviews in the Sunday Times, Telegraph and Spectator, not to mention other more niche right-wing leaning out outlets. Already, it's being used by right-wing deniers as their I told you so resource. Their point of reference when arguing about what the empire was really like, despite what woke people tell you. 
Amazon reviewers, for example, have titled their reviews, quote, imperious, brilliant historical research, and at last a competent book on the subject. Colonialism, the book, begins with the story of its author's persecution at the hands of us domineering anti-colonial academics and activists. Historians of colonialism have, according to Bigger, combined with unruly anti-racist students to put the British Empire on trial. We have found it guilty without even properly analysing the evidence. Why? Variously because we see, quote, anti-colonialism as fashionable, opening doors to posts, promotions and grants, or because we are brainwashed by Franz Fanon's, quote, preference for barbarous vitality and irresponsibility over civilised reason and restraint, or even because, quote, our degenerate Christian sensibility, which allows us to focus exclusively on our own sins. I think I can at least disown that one. <laughs> Worse than our motivations, however, is the effect of our work. Academic post-colonialism, we are told, quoting here, is an ally, no doubt inadvertent, of Vladimir Putin's regime in Russia and the Chinese Communist Party, which are determined to expand their own respectively authoritarian and totalitarian power at the, at the expense of the West. Our studies of empire are apparently indicative of the moral decadence that always triggers the collapse of dominant powers. Bigger writes, what is at stake in our writing of history is the very integrity of the United Kingdom and the security of the West. End quote. So colonialism was written not just to set the historical record straight, but to save a self-critical West from itself. It doesn't seem to have occurred to Bigger that arguing for the ethical justification of invasion and occupation of other lands might reinforce Putin's project a bit more directly than academic inquiry into colonial history. And nor does it seem to have struck him that Putin's main allies and supporters in the West tend to be on the alt-right fringes of politics rather than the woke. In, in many ways, Bigger's tone um, that the writing of history is a vital part of Western morale echoes uh, a body of literature that was produced by historians towards the end of the Second World War and in the immediate period of, of decolonisation in the 1950s and 1960s. And some of these historians are actually cited by Bigger including Frankel and Gannon Diagnan. But they were writing in the, the context of the decline and fragmentation of the British Empire and the rise of a new binary world order uh, between a US-dominated West and a Soviet-dominated bloc to the East, and vying for the loyalty and for the alignment of newly independent former colonies, which it was felt would either fall into one camp or the other or strike out on an independent so-called third world path. Gannon, Diagnan and Frankel, for instance, were part of a, a neoliberal um, clique which began to write histories of the empire as a civilising uh, project, updated for the 20th century as a developmental project, arguing that these newly independent African and Asian governments should owe their loyalty in the new binary world order to the West because of the developmental gains that colonialism had brought. So this was a kind of an early writing of Biggers, uh, late 20, or early, early 21st century script. His context then is not just cultural war, it's also Cold War, uh, with the new enemies of, of Putin and assertive China, replacing the, the Soviet bloc uh, of that earlier tradition. Despite Bigger's straw man caricature, professional historians tend not to focus solely on the costs of colonialism while denying its benefits, which is what he alleges. What we tend to have done in thousands of publications completely ignored by Bigger is specify benefits for whom, appreciating that they were not universal. There are library shelves full of monographs on how, for example, Indian merchants and princes worked alongside British officials and businessmen to enhance their status and wealth, and how sometimes fragile colonial administrations relied on negotiation and compromise with indigenous elites. There's reams of work on the emotional and affective ties that transcended racial boundaries. We don't just speak in binary terms uh, of race as colonial historians. There's also an enormous body of work on the developmental schemes that that earlier generation of neoliberal historians and, and bigger try to focus attention on, on colonial schooling, on agricultural and public health initiatives, which tended to come late on in the later stages of imperialism and in response to nationalist demands from indigenous elites. When, um, so when Twitter trolls send me images, for example, of British sailors rescuing enslaved Africans from other nations' slave ships 
after 1807 to point out the benevolent nature of British colonialism. It doesn't actually come as that much of a surprise to me because myself and many other historians have written plenty about the so-called liberated Africans and their fate as re captives assigned as unpaid labour to settlers in colonies elsewhere. Much to Bigger's annoyance, we seek also to tell the stories, though, of those who experienced trauma and loss through the British takeover of their lands and assumption of sovereignty. We don't sh tend to shy away from the millions who died in British wars of expansion and the great famines that colonial governments did little to mitigate. And we acknowledge the fact that colonialism guaranteed a readily exploitable labour supply to British settlers, planters and industrialists. <clears throat> we tend to recognise that racially organised hierarchies of wealth, status and power were the norm maintained in most colonies most of the time. It should come as no surprise to anyone really to learn that benefits for some came at the expense of others. So as I mentioned before, professional historians tend to write with an ethical code in mind, one that we were taught in our undergraduate and postgraduate training. I was actually trained as an historical geographer, but it was still the same kind of meticulous attention to an ethics of research. We are, of course, influenced by our individual dispositions and politics, but we try our best to set these aside and to develop our arguments through finding and reading all the relevant evidence. We tend to be curiosity, as I've mentioned, rather than politically driven. We're interested in explaining phenomena, not allocating collective virtue or blame. That seems to be a redundant exercise for most historians. When we select quotations from a source, we try to set them in the context of that source's overall stance, rather than cherry-picking from it to substantiate a predetermined argument. When we come across evidence that contradicts our general interpretation, we either try to explain the discrepancy or we modify the interpretation. We read widely to try to take account of the work that other scholars have done on our topic, and we're grateful for their efforts. In essence, we try, even if we don't always succeed, to avoid writing tendentiously. Now, let me come to Nigel Bigger's colonialism. This is littered with examples of what many of us would see as the most egregious misuse of sources. There's no space for me now, no time for me now to list uh, all of the examples I've uncovered, so I'll, I'll go through a few until I realise time's up, basically, and then draw to a conclusion. So to give one example, Bigger quotes the Canadian Métis leader, Louis Riel, who gave a speech at his trial for treason the fact that he was on trial for treason should give you a clue about how he felt about the colonial authorities. In 1885, to suggest, Bigger suggests, using this extract from Real's speech, that Real recognised the right of British settlers uh, to take Métis and First Nations land, that he saw at least the cogency of an argument, that because they weren't using it productively, others had the right to take it and use it more productively. The extract he uses from Real's speech to the jury is, is this. It's fairly long, so bear with me, please. British civilization has the means of improving life that Indians or half-breeds have not. So when they come into our savage country, in our uncultivated land, they come and help us with their civilization. But we helped them with our lands. So the question comes, your land, you Cree or you half-breed, your land is worth today one-seventh of what it will be when the civilization will have opened it. Your country unopened is worth to you only one seventh of what it will be when opened. I think it's a fair share to acknowledge the genius of civilization to such an extent as to give when I have seven pairs of socks, six, to keep one. So he uses that extract to suggest that Riel identified with this argument that because the Métis were not using their land productively, British settlers had the right to take six sevenths of it. However, Bigger omits crucial sentences before and after this extract, which drastically alter its meaning. We are led up to the extracted portion of this speech by saying, quote, when the British have crowded their country because they had no room to stay anymore at home, it does not give them the right to come and take the share of all the tribes besides them. In principle, then, he was saying that settlers were not entitled to any of the land. Riel proceeded to note that at least the, colonial, the Canadian colonial government had agreed a treaty which nominally allocated one-seventh of the land to the Métis and released six-sevenths for settlers, hence this, this fraction that was quoted in Riel's extract. In Bigger's selected extracts, Riel was actually paraphrasing 
that argument of the government, not endorsing it and not vocalising it himself. It was paraphrasing, paraphrasing the government's rationale that seizing six-sevenths was in exchange for the civilisation of British settlement brought. His point in paraphrasing it, though, was to say that even this nominal allocation of one-seventh left for the Métis has not been observed in practice. Bigger omits the next bit of real speech. He went on after that paraphrasing to say, they made this treaty with us. As they made the treaty, they have to observe it. And did they observe it? No. So intentionally or not, this may have been unintentional because Bigger takes this source from another right-wing culture warrior in Canada. Um, he obviously didn't check the original source. Intentionally or not, Bigger uses a cherry-picked extract to suggest that we all recognise the right of settlers to take Métis land when he was arguing precisely the opposite. The second example, Bigger consistently presents African people, in my view, and when I was writing the review for the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, I had to change the wording slightly, he presents African people, in my view, as unfit to govern themselves, as requiring British rule for their own sakes, even to the extent of repeating slave owners' original arguments against emancipation. He writes, can we be sure that descendants of enslaved people would have been better off had their ancestors remained in West Africa, some as slaves and sacrificial funeral fodder, end quote. Bigger's methods of establishing the necessity for British rule in Africa include frequent, seemingly innocuous asides, which have the cumulative effect of reinforcing tropes of African savagery. Human sacrifice seems to be his favourite. He states that, quote, it continued to be a part of royal funeral ceremonies in the Gold Coast as late as 1944. However, there's no evidence to support this claim. What Bigger's referring to was a singular and bizarre case of suspected murder that was discussed in Britain. Three suspects were hanged in the absence of a body, but the sentencing was delayed by protests that no murder had been committed. Now, there were other isolated instances <coughs> of murder, some of which has been classified as medicinal or ritual, but nothing like a pattern which would enable the, the statement of Biggers that they continued to be part of royal funeral ceremonies in the Gold Coast as late as 1944. So Bigger converts an isolated incident that the historian Richard Rathbone notes may or may not have taken place in southern Ghana on the 28th of February 1944 into a barbaric cultural practice that justified continued British rule. A third example, I'll make this the last example. In his attempt to defend Cecil Rhodes, Bigger disputes three racist quotes attributed to the mining magnate and politician. Although all could be discussed further, I'll focus on just the first. Bigger writes that in a 2006 book review, this is quoting now, Adekeya Adebajo sought to substantiate Rhodes's alleged racism and genocidal intent by reporting him as saying, quote, I prefer land to the N-word. Appearances, however, deceived, Bigger continues, for Adebajo had admitted to tell his readers that the quotation had been lifted from a novel by Olive Schreiner. It is fiction. <clears throat> Bigger later repeats, quote, the only documentary source is Schreiner's 1897 novel where the words are spoken by a character that looks like Rose. And again, he says, it is fiction. Well, Bigger is just plain wrong. A little research would have alerted him that the quote is not fiction. There's plenty of documentary evidence for it in sources including the Manchester Guardian, the Journal, the Illustrated London News and the Pall Mall Gazette. Rhodes even clarified that, quote, what he meant was that where there was a land bereft of natives and another swarming with natives, he preferred the former because he considered the latter not to be the advantage of South Africa, end quote. <clears throat> to add insult to the injury that Bigger inflicts on Adebajo, Bigger's own book, Colonialism, frequently uses fiction rather than historical evidence as sources including, and I haven't made this up, a reference to what a character in the TV drama The West Wing says, endorsing Bigger's point of view. So I'll skip the, the further examples. If you want to see them, they'll be uh, in this um, extended review in the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History online soon. And I'll come to some more general points about Bigger's book, aside from the specific instances of misuse of sources, thematic distortions, and then I'll conclude. Aside from a dubious approach to sources, there are further systematic flaws in Bigger's approach. 
Whereas other empires grew through conquest and invasion, there's a strange lack of violence in his version of how the British Empire came about. So he gives a kind of quick run through of how the empire expanded at the beginning of the book. Uh, he doesn't actually come back very often to elaborate on, on these incidents. So he writes, for example, from 1757, for 100 years, the East India Company came to rule vast swathes of Indian territory. The British acquired Hong Kong by treaty with Imperial China in 1842. In West Africa, British influence grew along the coast and then into the interior. The facts that many Indian states were conquered in battle, some by the future Duke of Wellington, as is very well known, that the treaty ceding Hong Kong to Britain was signed only after China's defeat in the First Opium War, which Bitter, Bigger himself later admits was unjustified, the only full-scale colonial war that was unjustified, according to him, and the fact that West African rulers were overthrown through a combination of armed force and deceit have no place in Bigger's explanation of how an empire seemed to just land in Britain's lap. Bigger's claim that, quote, for the second half of its life, anti-slavery, not slavery, was at the heart of imperial policy is simply absurd. The post-emancipation anti-slavery lobby was real, and as many historians have explained, including myself, it sought to influence colonial policy. Sometimes when it could mobilize public opinion sufficiently, it succeeded. So it was a political lobby and it did have some salience contingently. But to claim that anti-slavery generally outweighed commercial, strategic, and private British interests, and to infer that it was anti-slavery that prompted the over 60 colonial wars, which Bigger neglects to mention during the period, is ludicrously misleading. To believe it is to accept that Britons operated on some unique moral plane untouched by any other group in history. The most problematic feature of all, though, is the book's treatment of race. <clears throat> Bigger does not see himself or the liberal imperialists whom he defends as racist because they do not believe that black or brown peoples are biologically inferior to white people. They simply, quote, observe that these people's cultures were backwards compared to that of the British and other Europeans. By Bigger's definition, the attribution of, quote, cultural inferiority to a lack of development rather than biological nature, end quote, is not racist nor is his use of the word natives to describe all the diverse and multifarious peoples colonized by Britons. Asserting a biological distinction, as I probably don't need to tell anyone in this room, may not be the only way of being racist, however. Oxford Languages defines racism as, quote, the belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, or qualities, especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. Simply substituting the word cultures for races in this definition, which it seems to me is what Bigger does, does little to change the dynamic. Bigger's argument is that deployed by most British colonial officials from the early 19th century, that while exceptional indigenous individuals might learn the benefits of British civilization rapidly, most were so culturally backward that it would take generations for them to develop. When colonised people showed evidence of their learning British ways and sought inclusion, however, as many did from the late 19th century onwards, white people still maintained an exclusive right to govern, with just a few concessions to local or advisory roles towards the end of empire. This fact does not feature in Bigger's account, and neither does the possibility that people of any culture stroke race might access technologies without being conquered, dispossessed, and subjected to racially hierarchical alien rule. The historian Michael Taylor sums up the general colonial situation well when he quotes a British planter. And to quote, preeminence and distinction are necessarily attached to the complexion of a white man. Failing to acknowledge everyday colonial racism is, seems to me like examining Nazi Germany without the anti-Semitism or modern Russia without the communism. Racism was a common sense belief system that fundamentally underpinned the British Empire. And it's deeply concerning to me, at least, that there's now such an appetite to deny this with semantic differences between race and culture. Bigger's excuse for his lack of primary research or knowledge of the literature is that he's not an historian and he's not writing a history book, but an analysis of ethics. However, he has to acknowledge that his ethical case relies on, to quote him, judging by what we have seen of the British case. Well, what we have seen, what he bases his ethical judgment on, is a distorted and partial account 
determined from the start by the intention to excuse rather than to analyse. It seems that the only way one can defend the ethics of colonialism is to write unethically, I think. It's just too tempting to turn Bigger's own words against his book. To quote him of Woke, this unscrupulous indifference to historical truth indicates that the controversy over empire is not really a controversy about history at all. It's about the present, not the past, end quote. Okay, I'll leave it there. I was going to say a bit more about the politics of engaging with, with Bigger, but I think that may come up in, in discussion. So I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, mate.